Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity that you give us to come to your presence, to come and hear your voice, Lord. I pray this morning that it won't be my face, it won't be my voice or my sounds speaking and being seen here this morning, that it be you, that it be your presence, that it be your voice, that it be you touching the hearts and minds of everyone here. We praise you and we thank you. So most of you know that I recently started a new job. I kind of made a big deal about it, right? It's like, oh my like, God. Happy and excited and all of that stuff. And you know the routine. First few days is orientation, then the official introductions with your co-workers and supervisors and getting to know the different departments and how everything works and where are the supplies, where's the restroom, that's important. <laughs> And, you know, basically getting to know the place <clears throat> where you can have lunch and then it's, I'm used to Harlingen and West Laco area and I'm in Brownsville so it's like driving around town trying to figure out my way around. So, you know, then after you kind of get used to the, the area, you follow by getting acquaint, acquainted with uh, your workplace, right? Your new office space, whatever you get to have, right? Well, have uh, an office, sort of. Uh, it has like a lot of storage in it. I don't know why. It kind of feels like a closet. I told my supervisor who, yeah, 99.9% .9 sure he has been at the closet at some point in his life. <laughs> I said to him, I don't know why, I feel like I'm back in the closet. <laughs> and you know that it's a very lonely place. So, it's like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. The client cleaning the office slash closet. I don't know. So it's getting better. So <clears throat> soon you find yourself, you know, talking to your coworkers about, you know, professional and professional, professional and personal experiences. And little by little, as the days pass by, we find ourselves kind of like finding how we fit, right, in our new team and how we get along and all that good stuff. And something that I have learned in my journey, you know, it's not my first rodeo, like the country singer would say, um, is that more, more often than not, you can usually find the same characters everywhere you go. Yeah, we can always count on the complainer. He's always there, or she. The one that is always tired, feeling overworked, or just too cold, or is too hot, or is too whatever. Whatever the day is, it's just a uh, lie. And we always can count on finding the friendly one. <sighs> Those are the lucky, ah, <laughs> where's the friendly one? You know? And that's the one that is so excited to meet you. And it, they just want to know everything about your whole life. In the first 10 minutes, you say, my name is Ali. <laughs> All right? You know somebody like that. I know somebody like that. <laughs> and of course, you always can find the fun boy. Dramatic one. Right? The one that is, has a witty attitude and is very, um, everything is, oh my God, that can be the end of the world. Oh, right? <laughs> and we can always count on finding the boss. The one that, whether by position or very more often than not, by self assignment, they think and they act like he or she is a big shot in the office. And uh, on, <clears throat> I'm sorry, all of this and many other characteristics, they mingle in the office and at home and everywhere we go, right? And uh, they usually balance each other, each other out, you know? And slowly, slowly, as you come into a new place, you get to identify some of those characters and, you know, some you get to know faster than others. For example, my very, very first day, I was able to identify the boss. Not the real boss, you know, the boss, you know, oh, that's my supervisor, I know my boss. But the self-appointed boss, I got to know him pretty quickly. And we all know one of those in our office, or whatever kind of workplace you have. And if you don't know who it is in your office, guess what? Guess what? It's you. 
So, you will think, uh, how did you get to meet your self-appointed boss so quickly in your department? Well, let me explain to you what happened. I was hired to develop this new crisis in, to help develop, not to develop, but to help develop this new crisis intervention program for this new hospital, right? And I'm definitely excited, I'm thrilled, I'm afraid, and I'm nervous, but I'm excited about the opportunity that has been given to me to be part of this team effort, team <coughs> effort, that will benefit not just me and my career and all that, but it's gonna benefit a lot of people in the middle, suffering in the middle of crisis, right? So on my first day, my coworker, who has just been hired from another, uh, to another department, approached me and asked me, why didn't I get the position offered to me during my application process? And he proceeded to question me about his experience, my experiences and, you know, where have you been, what have you done, which is, I told him, well, I've been a clinician for five years or so, and I told him about some of my experiences, certifications, all the boring stuff, right? And he then explained to me that his qualifications were so much better than mine. Okay, great, I said, that's awesome. And he said it. I just recently graduated from my master's program. And he was puzzled because he had so much more experience than me. And to give him an honest answer, I was like, I don't know. Like, I don't know why they didn't offer the job to you. Like, I feel bad. Like, I, I just got here today and, you know, like, I feel like kind of uncomfortable here. So I, re I told him, I really don't know what to tell you. I mean, I've been doing this counseling thing for quite a while. And, for more, uh, most overconfident I want to be, I still feel I have a long way to go. And I told him the same thing. I'm like, you just graduated, buddy. You know, come down, you know? Plus, I, th I wasn't part of your hiring process, you know? I was trying to kind of like calm his curiosity down. Like, you know, I just didn't just drop here in a parachute and open. You know, it's like I just, I just applied and they call me, right? So, and the reason I, I chose this job, it wasn't because uh, I was going to be a boss. I didn't even know I was going to be a boss. You know, I discovered that later. Uh, I chose it because it was something new and challenging, and I was excited to be part of it. And uh, that's the whole reason why. He's still mad at me, but Nimolo, right? <laughs> and we, we see this everywhere, every day, everywhere we go. There's people seeking preeminence, glory, honor seeking power and positions. And there's nothing wrong with that. We have talked about that before. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be the best in whatever we do. But everything has a time and a place. And as my friend will get to learn with time, we're gonna have an opportunity to learn a little bit more in today's lesson. Because today's lesson, we're going back to Mark, and we're gonna pick up exactly what Michaela left us last week when she talked to us about how the things that we treasure in our lives are a sign of our priorities in life. And today, Jesus is on his way the road to Jerusalem. And he's walking with the disciples. You know, there was no car back then, so there was no buses. And now I'm sure a lot of will hook him up with a bus <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> but for the next three years. Huh? <laughs> But there was no such thing back then, so they were walking and talking, and there was people following them, like always. And they kind of stop on the side of the road, I guess, to kind of like take a breath and last for a few minutes. And uh, Jesus took the twelve apart and said, look guys, we're going to Jerusalem right now. And you know these people here in Jerusalem, they don't like me very much. So they're going to turn me over to the authorities, and they will say that I have to die. And uh, they're going to turn me over to the non-Jewish people who will laugh at me, they will spit at me, they will beat me, they will whip me. And after all that, they're going to crucify me. But on the third day, and then in the middle of the speech, on the third day, wait, Jesus. James and John interrupted Jesus and said, hey, well, we, but before you die and all that that you're talking about, I need to ask you for a favor, personal favor. And I can imagine Jesus kind of confused. Okay, I was about to say that I was going to die. And, 
okay, but what do you need? Tell me, what can I do for you? And uh, they said to Jesus, before you die, we want you to make sure you let everybody know here who's in charge. And once you in the kingdom, just to be sure that they know, everybody knows, you know, your friend and your buddy, uh, let us see one of us in your right hand and the other one on the left hand. In other words, give us position and power next to you. And I think John and James were kind of like feeling entitled, right, to those ranks and positions. Because after all, they were cousins, you know, family, uh, family. And uh, they were also kind of like the right hand. They were big help for Jesus. But Jesus was like, I don't think you know what you're asking for. Because if you want my position next to me, that means you kind of have to do what I'm about to do out there. And I, myself, I don't even want to do it. <laughs> so you, want to go? Nah, I don't think you want to do that. <clears throat> so they said, yes, Master, we are ready to do whatever is needed. And I can't imagine just Jesus like, uh, like for real. I think you're missing the point here. And he goes further, further and I tell James and John that in his kingdom, positions are not going to be given based on, you know, family or selfish ambition or accomplishment. But they're giving according to the will of God. And I mean, Jesus was just talking about his death. Talk about timing, right? And uh, these guys are just concerned about power and position. And if I was Jesus, I would be kind of mad and pretty upset. And I will be probably overly dramatic about it. Yeah, do you find who I was in the world? <laughs> That's just another reason why I'm not Jesus. I will be like, oh my God, these guys, right? Something like that. And then Jesus continued telling them, you know what, guys? The other nations have rulers. And you know that those rulers, they just love to show the power over people. And they are, they're important leaders. You see how, what they do? They use our authority to show everybody. <laughs> that was all part of the plan. All of it. So, <clears throat> That shouldn't be the way it should work among us, guys. We're different. Whoever wants to come and become the great one among you must serve the rest of you first, like a servant. And whoever wants to become the first, they should be themselves like a slave to you. Whoever wants to be the, the, the first one must be like a slave. And in the same way, the Son of Man did not come to be served, Jesus told them he came to serve others and to give his own life as a ransom to many. What a beautiful statement. So the thing is that while James and John were concerned about where they're going to end up when Jesus died, Jesus was more concerned about telling them, hey guys, don't worry about that whole crown stuff. Don't worry about who's right or left. The fact is that it does not matter. It does not matter how big or small you think you are in your service to God. We are just the same in His eyes. Okay? And the way to greatness can be very different to all of us. And the price that each one of us must pay to get to what we consider greatness is definitely going to look different to every single one of us who are here this morning. I mean, you may have just graduated and be the first time, your first job experience, and you want to feel like you are at the same level as those who have been doing the same thing for five or ten years. Granted, you, that's your way to greatness, and that is okay. Nothing wrong with that. But like I told my friend, it does not matter what you're doing and how great or how tall in the ladder you feel that you are. What matter is that you take the opportunity at hand and be of service to those who you have been to serve at the time that you have been called to serve them. In the service to God, greatness is a much, much different thing and is all a much different level. So it does not matter if you have been called to preach up here every Sunday. It does not matter if you have been called to lead the praise. It does not matter if you are just in the classroom with the kids. It does not matter 
if you your call is to come on Saturday and make sure that our church looks as beautiful as it does today thank you guys that you do that it does not matter the point is to serve to be the Lord's hands and feet because we are all part of the body and it does not matter which role we play you are an important part of our church body and if you feel you have not been given the opportunity to serve there are many areas in which your knowledge and experience experiences are very much needed and maybe you you feel that the Lord has put something in your heart a new ministry, a new idea, or a new project that you have been wanting to start here at our church or even in your personal life, I ask you today, just do it. Don't wait. Don't wait for the right time. Don't wait for the right people. Don't wait for the right, I don't know, whatever you're waiting for. There's no reason to wait. This church is destined to greatness. It is destined to greatness and it's our duty Whoever comes here, all of you guys, all the new faces, all of the faces that have been here for 10 or 20, whatever many years you've been around, you are needed and we are thankful for everything that you are doing for us, for Jesus, for his service. And, I, and if you don't know how to do it, just tell us. And we'll figure out a way how to do it together. Because we're all on this together. Isn't that awesome? We're all part of the same body. <clears throat> Christ is our head, and we, the Christians, the ones sitting here, going in and out of this building, we are his body, and we are joined together as a body is held together, and our strength is coming from Christ. I'm going to leave you with this thought. Everything that we do here at church, at home, at the office, at the store, everything that we do, Everywhere we go, we are serving someone. We are serving ourselves. We are serving our families, our boss, our co-workers, our clients, whoever they might be. But we are also serving Christ in everything that we do. Whether we intend it or not, we are serving Christ. And the same, same man that found the way to greatness by leaving his own crown and his kingdom to become a servant to you and to me. That Jesus, who is our king, his way to greatness meant to become a simple man who walked among us and healed and forgave and washed the feet of sinners. This Jesus, Jesus ways to greatness, his own way to greatness. It was meant to allow other human beings to humiliate him and crucify him and die a horrible death, all to serve you and me, so we can have an abundant life full of love and service to one another.